So we are in a study of the last half of the book of Acts. And we've been looking at how this small group of Jewish believers in Jesus became this global movement. And I want you to go ahead and turn your in your Bibles to chapter 23 and 24 in the book of Acts. We're going to be there in just a moment. But I want to start today with a story uh, about a man named Lawrence Ripple. In 2016, at the age of 71, he walked into a bank in Kansas City, Missouri to rob it. He showed the teller a gun and he asked for a bag of money and she did exactly what she was trained to do. And then he told the teller, I would like for you to call the police now. And he went to a bench inside the lobby and sat down calmly waiting to be arrested. Well, when he was asked about his behavior, why he did what he did, he explained, I would rather go to jail than spend one more day with my wife. Well, it gets better. Time for him to go to trial. And when he finally the judge wisely, sentenced him to six months house arrest. Someday, all of us are going to stand before an even wiser judge. And the reality should actually be a source of our unhindered hope that that's going to happen to us. And we are reminded of that when we study the life of a man who spent a lot of his life on trial. I'm talking, of course, about the Apostle Paul. So a little background before we get right into our text today. Two weeks ago, I told you that Paul had returned to Jerusalem, even though the Holy Spirit had warned him of hardships that were awaiting him when he got there. He was in the temple when some people from Asia, where he had been doing mission work, spotted him. And they started telling people, this is the guy that's been telling us not to follow the law anymore. Now, they lied, but that ended up starting a riot and they started to beat Paul and the Roman soldiers showed up and they rescued Paul and Paul asked if he could speak to this frenzied mob and last week we looked at what Paul shared with this frenzied crowd and he talked about how he had personally met the resurrected Jesus and that when he had that conversation with Ananias in Damascus he said well what are you waiting for get up and be baptized and wash your sins away and when they heard him say that Jesus was sending him to the Gentiles, they went ballistic. And the Roman commander realized that they were not going to be able to make anything happen here, so they took Paul back into the barracks, and this is Roman justice for you, and he was about to have Paul whipped and flogged to get him to confess to his crime when Paul pulled this one out. Look at Acts 22, verse 25. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? And everybody gasped and got nervous because it was a big no-no in the Roman judicial system to ever punish a Roman citizen if you didn't know what they were guilty of. So they, they totally backed up and they said, okay, well, we cannot do anything with this man until we found out, find out if he's guilty of a crime that Rome even cares about. So now we're going to pick up in chapter 23. They brought him the next morning before the whole Sanhedrin. And look what it says in verse six. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin. My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. And when he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the whole assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels or spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So Paul, in a brilliant tactical move, basically divides the entire room. 
The Sadducees did not believe in the supernatural. And maybe that's why you have no record in the New Testament of a Sadducee ever becoming a follower of Jesus. Now, Pharisees did, but not one Sadducee is recorded. Because you cannot become a Christian if you do not believe in the supernatural. Now, I'll talk more about that in a moment. So the whole place, again, just erupts. And again, the Romans take Paul out of the room. And look what happens now. Pick up in verse 12. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priest's and elders. And that's a major red flag. What is the job of the chief priests and elders? It is to safeguard the law of Moses. Well, what does the law of Moses say? Remember, there's this list of, of 10 things that were kind of important. And one of them said, you shall not kill. And now some men are coming to them saying, well, we plan to kill Paul and we want you to help us do that. And these guys are okay with that. That just shows you how sick religion can get. Religion, when it thinks that something is a valuable goal, can get into bed with very evil ideas and very evil people in order to pursue that goal. We'll continue in verse 14. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin... Petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Now, this is the only mention in our entire Bible of Paul's family. Apparently, he had a sister and she had at least one child. So this boy goes and he tells Paul and Paul calls the guard and the guard tells the centurion and the centurion gets the commander and look what the commander does in verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get a ready detachment, uh, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. You see, if you are a Roman commander, the one thing you don't want on your watch is a Roman citizen being ambushed and killed. And so imagine, it's kind of comical almost, and Paul's got to be smiling because the Roman army at great expense gets this huge battalion of soldiers to get Paul safely to Caesarea and go before Governor Felix. By the way, Governor Felix was not a good man. Most Roman governors were not, but he was a cruel man. He was a vindictive man. He was a very immoral man, and none of the Jews respected him. But now Paul is in his jurisdiction, and now the Jews have got to go up to Caesarea to continue their issue with Paul, and they bring with them a lawyer named Tertullus. Look what it says, chapter 24, verse 5. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, Stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges that we are bringing against him. Now, notice what they are accusing Paul of doing. They are accusing him of unrest because the one four letter word in the Roman government that was not tolerated was riot. Rome didn't care what you believed as long as you would say Caesar is Lord once a year. They didn't care who or what you worshiped or what your faith was about. But what they would not tolerate was civil instability. So that's what they are accusing Paul of doing. Now, Paul knows that's not the real issue. And so Paul gets to speak and he's going to do exactly what he did back in Jerusalem. He's going to drop the R bomb on them. Look what I mean. Pick up in verse 12. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. 
And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So Paul says, this is not about politics. This is about theology. And he said, he's not making them angry because of what he was doing in the streets, but because of what he was saying about Jesus, a man that they had killed. And to make it very clear, let's pick up in verse 20. Or these here, or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So Felix, listening to all of this, basically said, if this is about religion, then this is not something that I really care about. Now, he has to be a politician he has to keep the Jews happy. He dismisses them, but he keeps Paul there in prison. But he's got a problem. There is nothing that Paul has done that violates Roman law. But if he lets him go, he infuriates the people that he needs to keep calm. And it kind of ends this way in verse 24. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess, and he sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. Now, please notice that when you talk about faith in Christ Jesus, here are the kind of topics that you discuss. Continue in verse 25. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. And we'll talk about what happens after this next time. But let's, let's go ahead now and just review quickly. This, this is not about politics. This is about theology. Paul said, I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And Paul's big argument every time that he is on trial is the reason that I live the way that I live, the reason that I teach what I teach, the reason that I do what I do is because of the reality of my personal encounter with the resurrected Christ. So he dodges all the side issues and he goes right to the real issue. And here is the real issue. Write it down. The real issue is, is Jesus' resurrection for real? You see, Christianity rises or falls on the answer to that question. And I want you to understand that it is really irrelevant whether or not Christianity is winsome or whether it is morally helpful if the foundational claims of the Christian faith are not true. Christianity without a resurrection, without a supernatural claim of Jesus coming back from the dead, Christianity without that has not lost its last chapter. It no longer has a story to tell. That's what Paul said. And 1 Corinthians 15 that Charity read at the beginning of our service. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And so like Paul, when we explain our faith in Christ, we need to make the real issue the real issue. Arguing about a woman in the pulpit or about the Nephilim or about the very important theological question of whether Adam had a belly button or not is not as important as going to the heart of the matter. Because if Jesus Christ came back from the dead, then Christianity is true. And that's why you should be a Christian. I said this a few weeks back, that if you ask most people why they are a Christian, you're going to get one of three answers. Well, because my parents were. Or because I had this experience. Or because, you know, I tried it and it really helped my life. And those aren't bad answers. But you can be a part of any religion in the world and give one of those three answers. There is only one reason to be a Christian, because it's true. 
Because it's based on a historical claim that actually happened. You cannot be ambivalent about the resurrection. You cannot claim, well, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. It either happened or it did not. And this is the real issue. J. Warner Wallace was one of our country's best known cold case detectives. He, he worked in Los Angeles and he solved some of their most difficult uh, He was on uh, television shows across the nation. He was an atheist. And when he was asked by Christians on the police force to come to church with them, he, he would always ask them, well, why are you a Christian? And he said he always got such pitiful answers. He didn't want to be a Christian unless it was true. So he decided to investigate it himself and he applied to the gospels and, and to the resurrection the same techniques that he uses to solve murder cases. And he studied himself into the faith and he concluded, I could take the evidence for the claim of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus into court and I could win. See, this is the issue. If Jesus Christ came back from the dead, you ought to be a Christian. By the way, it should be noted that not one of Paul's critics in that courtroom that day offered an explanation about the missing body of Jesus. Not one of them stood up and said, there's no way he's right on this. We could show you his body. You need to understand. The Christianity was birthed in the single place. It would have been the easiest to stop it. If Christianity, it, it began not 300 years after the life of Christ. It didn't begin 3,000 miles away from where Jesus lived and died. But just a few days later, in the very same city where he died, people began to say, I, I saw him. He's alive. And they could not stop it. What, what caused the brother of Jesus, James, to change his mind about Jesus? What caused Paul to change his mind? What made these people willing to go into the entire known world? What caused them to be willing to suffer and die? They had witnessed the defeat of death in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's what Paul was saying that day. I've got a, a living hope. Hope. It is an unhindered hope because the significance of Jesus' resurrection is unparalleled. So let's, let's just talk very quickly about some things that this means for us. Write this down. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that God is on the throne. I hope that you could see the sovereignty of God at work in the text that we went, went through. Here are the Jews. And they are conniving and they are planning and they are scheming to get rid of Paul. And all of their, in, in, in all of their intricate connivings, they are brought to nothing by eavesdropping nephew. You see, God can deliver through supernatural means. He did that in the book of Acts chapter five. The apostles are in prison and, and God sends in an angel and they just walk right out. Chapter 12, Paul, Peter is in prison and God sends an angel again. They walk right out. Chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. God sends an earthquake and the chains just drop right off. And in chapter 23, Paul is in prison and there's a plot to ambush him and an eavesdropping nephew stops it. My point is sometimes he does it with visible supernatural miracles and sometimes he does it through invisible providence. But either way, God is large and in charge. It says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. I believe God is on the throne and I believe the resurrection proves it. That means that God is never threatened. God is never surprised. He's never going to wonder what he's going to do next. It is confidence in the sovereignty of God that makes us live the way we live. For example, why did Paul not give Felix a bribe? 
He could have gotten out of prison. But he told Paul that he was going to get him to go to Rome. So Paul said, I don't need to get in bed with a dirt ball to do what I know that God is already going to do for me. Paul was trusting in a higher throne for his future. God said in Isaiah 46 that only he can tell you the future before it happens. And I believe that our God is on the throne and I believe that the resurrection proves it. I believe God does whatever he wants because you know what? When you can tell death what to do, nobody can tell you what to do. An empty tomb should keep us full of confidence and the sovereignty of God. And knowing God is in control should help us to control our anxiety. So an election should not cause us anxiety. A virus should not cause us anxiety because that is the second reality of the resurrection. Write it down. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that fear is on the run. I have to admit... I look at social media and I wonder if a lot of Christians understand this. You hear Christians talk about all millennialism, premillennialism, postmillennialism. I think many Christians are pessimillennialists. They post and they rant and they act so nervous and so fearful about the future. And I think that that is an indictment on our lack of focus on the real issue. If Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, if death, has been defeated, then why should we ever be deflated? What Jerusalem and Rome soon learned is that you cannot intimidate a man who knows that death could not hold a man. In fact, go back to verse 11, chapter 23. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so also you must testify in Rome. Resurrection people are courageous people. We are not tyrannized by timidity because we know the final story. In fact, when when you put Paul on trial, every time he gives his defense, he goes on offense. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we have this hope, so we are very bold. We are not intimidated by anyone or anything. Fear leaves the room because the resurrected Christ entered the picture. In fact, fear changes teams. I don't know if you noticed that. Paul should have been the one afraid, right? And Paul is the one that's on trial. Paul is the one that people are trying to kill. Paul is the one whose future depends on an absolutely immoral and corrupt politician. But Paul, full of hope, made his case, and fear changed teams. Look again, Acts 24, verse 24. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, sending for Paul. They listened to him as about faith in Christ Jesus as he reasoned with them about righteousness, self-control, and the coming day of judgment. Felix became frightened. You see... There's one more thing that that we don't talk about enough, and it is absolutely true. If Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, it is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that judgment is on the way. It says that Paul was telling Felix about believing in Jesus, and evidently to Paul, talking about believing in Jesus includes righteous living, self-control, and a coming judgment. So why did Paul talk about judgment? Well, because Jesus did. You go through your Gospels, put a dot by every line where Jesus talked about judgment, and you're going to have a Gospel full of dots. Why did Jesus talk about judgment so much? Because it's true. And His resurrection proved it. Listen to Jesus in John chapter 5. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself but Him who sent me. Jesus said, don't be surprised. Every single person who has ever lived is going to rise from the dead and face judgment. And I think that deep down, most people know that. I think deep down, most people know that they're not just some cosmic accident. 
deep down, most people know history is actually headed somewhere and there must be an accounting for the kind of life that you live. And to deny that is to deny the entire Jesus resurrection what it was for. You see, Jesus came to prepare us for the judgment that is coming. And because of his death and the resurrection, when you hear that judgment is coming, that should not fill you with dread. It should fill you with great hope. When Calvin Coolidge was vice president and he was presiding over the Senate and there was a a very sharp disagreement that arose uh, during a debate and one senator yelled at another senator, you can go to hell. And the offended senator turned towards Coolidge and he said, did you hear what he said to me? And Coolidge looked up and said, well, I've been reading the rule book and it says you don't have to go. I want you to lean in very close on this. When you hear that judgment day is coming, you should immediately be filled with hope. And here's why. Because Jesus took your judgment on the cross. And because your judgment has already been received in Jesus, you have no reason to dread or fear or despair. See, There's a great lie that most people believe, and that is that if there's a judgment and I stand before God, I'm going to tell him, well, I've been a good person. I wasn't perfect, but I definitely tried and and I've been good and I definitely was a lot better than, you know, those. And I want you to hear me as closely as you can. Do not make that case before God. Nobody is going to to be saved because they have sin less than the only way that you can be saved is because God judges you sinless. And the only way that you can be judged sinless is because your judgment for your sins has been paid by Christ and his righteousness has been transferred to you because of your faith in him. That's how people are saved. His resurrection is the guarantee is able to make us right with God, but it is also the promise that someday He's going to make everything right. Jesus is coming back and His coming back from the dead is proof that someday He's going to put everything back right that death has touched and death touched everything. That's why the coming judgment is good news, especially when times are bad. Listen to what Paul said in Romans. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. Judgment is coming and I cannot wait. Because that means that the curse is going to finally be cursed and death is going to finally be dead and God is going to have the world that he has always wanted for real. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, it is real. So don't let anything hinder your hope. One of England's most beloved preachers in the 1800s was a man named Joseph Parker. And when his wife passed away, you know how tombstones, they, they have the, the date of your birth and the date of your death. But on her tombstone, he, he had this inscribed, the birth and then the date. And then instead of the word death, he had the word ascended inscribed. And I love that. It said, this is the day her spirit ascended, soon to be joined with her resurrected body in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. What was he doing? He was doing what all of us believers should do. He was coping with hope. And that's what we do. We, we live in a very, very hard world. 
Every single week, it seems like there's something else on the news to break our hearts. The political climate in our country is so toxic right now. And, and on a personal level, all of us struggle with health problems, with relationships, and we lose people that we love deeply. And in a world like that, just like Paul, you and I are on trial. Do you believe the resurrection of Jesus is for real? Are we resigned to death? Or are we defined by hope? Are you living a life that gives testimony? The grave. I want you to stand up. I want to pray with you.